take a look today at chapter 3. In this chapter, we are studying the women's movements. When we talk about women's movements, one of the things that we're looking at is comparing different time periods together in order to get a better understanding of our gender communication in present day society. One of the ways that we examine this is by looking at rhetoric. This is persuasion in essence. When we look at rhetorical movements, we're looking at groups of people that are working together in order to change the minds of those in the society around them. This sometimes is their attitudes, it's sometimes their laws, and often their policies. One example of that would be a group of liberal feminists. This group of people wanted to communicate to society at large that women and men are alike and equal in most respects. On the other hand, we have another group called the cultural feminists. These women and men are, or these women believe that women and men are fundamentally different and therefore they should have different rights, roles and opportunities. Although both of these groups worked to persuade society to change things and to elevate the prestige and respect for women, they took they took it from two totally different perspectives. So let's take a look at feminist movements in the United States. When we talk about these women's movements or these feminist movements, we divide them into three categories. We examine them through waves based on the time periods they existed in. The first wave of feminism was from 1840 to 1925. We see two women surface at this time, Alice Paul and Lucy Burns. And they are two women who are working really, really hard to promote women in society in order to get them the right to vote. What's interesting is we have what we call the cult of domesticity at this time. It means that anybody who's pushing for women's rights is really pushing for their rights still in a domestic capacity. So they want women to be able to vote on issues that are involved with families, communities, and domestic life. One of those items is regulating child labor. August 26th of 1920, based on the efforts of these women and others, women earn the right to vote. However, the very first item that they really want to go to vote with is to regulate child labor, and we see that that fails in 1925. Between the failure of this and the inability of women to first of all, understand and know that they can go and vote, second of all, have access to a voting location and transportation, very few women actually participated in the vote. So at the end of the first wave, what we see is that women are still focusing on good homes, families, and communities. They realized that they uh, not only needed to gain the vote for equality, but so far they had only pushed forth stereotypical women's concerns, and in the end, very few actually voted. After the first wave, we see a 35-year cessation of pushes for women's rights in the United States. The movements don't do anything. We don't see any individual surface. We don't see any nonviolent protests. We don't see anything coming forth to change women's place in society. And then we get to 1960, and we see both those liberal and cultural ideologies that we discussed earlier rising. And this is Based on those two, and remember again, liberal feminism looks at men and women being essentially alike and sh therefore should have the same rights and roles in society, and cultural feminism saying, no, women and men are essentially different, but their rights and roles in society should be the same, or their, their rights should be the same, their roles may be different. However, now we see radical feminism rise, and radical feminism takes a totally different approach and says, women absolutely do not they should have all the same rights as men and they probably need to do it in a separatist concept. So radical feminism, it grows from new left politics and basically radical feminists tell us that women are oppressed and based on their oppression, all other oppression arises. So when we see the oppression of African Americans in the United States or disabled Americans in the United States or any other groups that don't have equal rights and privileges, we see that that oppression stems from the fundamental oppression of women. Some of the events that these radical feminists conducted were the occupation of the Home Journal's office, the protests against pageants and any other sex object issues, and for the first time we see, we see the public actually carrying on conversations about rape and abortion because these women came out into the forefront with them. 
From this group grows a second group called Lesbian Feminists. This group asserts that women that love and live with other women can only truly put women first. This group is very small, they don't gain a lot of popularity, and we don't see a lot change based on this group. From that group, however, a separatist notion grows. And if you look at the years that this is happening, this is also a time when separate but equal is a concept we exhibit in race relations in the United States as well. And so women looked at that and said, well, you know what, maybe we need to build separate communities and live independent, but have some mutual respect and harmony. Their belief was that really you cannot combat patriarchy unless you separate yourself from it. <clears throat> from this we see a backlash. And the backlash comes from a group called Revelors. And these are feminists who want attention, recognition, support and respect for traditional women's activities. They want that to be considered contribution to society. They work to increase their value in society based on traditional roles. From this grows another group called Ecofeminists, and this group works really just to eliminate the cultural enhancement of oppression at all, and they really focus on oppression, not just for women, but anything, the environment, animals, uh, race relations, and they basically say, as long as oppression is culturally valued, it will, be pr it will be imposed upon anybody who doesn't fight against it. At the end of this, we're at the end of the second wave of feminism. We see that through these first two waves, women have gained the right to vote, the media is covering them, they've participated in public demonstrations, and the conversation about women is taking place in society. Their rights are still not at the, of their male counterparts, their wages are not at the level of their male counterparts, their ability to work outside the home is not at the level of their male counterparts, but the conversation is taking place. When we see what that conversation looks like, we see books like The Feminine Mystique issued, and you can take a look at page 81 of your textbook in order to see how the National Organization of Women was formed, in order to find out the input that this book had on society and kind of, you know, the summary of the second wave. We also see a group of womenists and they don't want to be considered feminists. They find the cultural ideology that men and women are alike in many ways and they highlight the associations between gender, race, and class issues. For more information on this, see page 83 in your textbook. We also see groups that focus on race. One of the things that we realize is that the female experience in the United States in the 60s and 70s varies based on the race of the woman. So African American women did not have the same experience as Caucasian women in the United States. They were, and what we realize is race can't be viewed in, isol in isolation, neither can gender. We have to look at how all different areas of our systems intersect, class, gender, sexual orientation, etc. Which leads us into what we call power feminism. And this is an interesting perspective. It takes place in the early 90s. We see that the people who participate in it are middle to upper middle class Caucasian women. And Naomi Wolf comes forward and says, hey women, stop thinking of yourselves as a victim. We see uh, events such as Take Back the Night, which you can certainly Google and read more about. And we see other nonviolent protests. What this group did though is they embraced the experience of the white heterosexual middle and upper class woman and that woman really hadn't experienced the same violation and discrimination as women in lower classes or of other races so this group really really did not stand up for a large number of women. <laughs>